Yes, I want to ask one, one final question, and this goes back to, to the financing aspect of it, because, uh, again, as, as innovative and interesting and cool as it may be, if, if folks can't afford it up front, um, they just kind of look uh, with, with some amount of, of envy at, okay, maybe one day uh, I'll be there. And so, so the ways that we can help facilitate uh, access, I think, is going to be important. And so I, I appreciated the conversation about the on-bill um, financing. Um, uh, I don't remember which one of you mentioned, you know, we, within uh, Senator Shaheen and Portman's bill, we've got the SAVE Act there, we've got uh, the Loan Guarantee Program. Are there, are there other financing policies that, in your opinion, DOE should be looking to uh, as, as we talk about their efficiency efforts um, uh, and and then I wanted to ask on the on the on bill financing um, in in my home state you know when we, we recognize that the weatherization assistance program has been extraordinarily uh, invaluable to to families but it it again has that uh, that up front uh, uh, costs that can be prohibitive for so many. So do you think that the on-bill financing would work, uh, would have application to that program as, as well, something that we could look to? But w what else um, within DOE might we do other than loan guarantee? Mr. Brissett. Thank you, Senator. <clears throat> Madam Chairwoman. Um, yes, I think that's right. And uh, especially in a place like Alaska where there's, um, you have, you know, um, like I mentioned, oil and resistance heat, um, you can use the financing that's provided by on bill to provide capital for equipment replacements and then you always want to do your weatherization measures whether that's funded by the weatherization assistance program or whether it's uh, financed at a market rate by a local contractor you always want to do air sealing duct sealing and insulation those are the three things you always want to do um, in addition to making an equipment replacement weatherization has served about seven or a little bit more than seven million homes but the need of weatherization is much, much more than that. Tens of millions of homes are, are qualified for weatherization. And frankly, the appropriations that um, are, are not where they need to be. There are weatherization authorization bills that are, that are before Congress, including one I believe that passed out of this committee a few months ago. It's an incredibly important program. One thing that weatherization does as well is that it really encourages a local network of contractors who are qualified to make these improvements. So you have what weatherization does, yes, it makes improvements to people's home, but it also ensures that in pretty much everywhere in the country, there is a cadre of people who are qualified to make those improvements. And quality installation is very, very important. Um, with respect to other things DOE could do, um, you always want to give a shout out to the state energy program. A lot of really remarkable innovation is done in state energy offices, and especially since the stimulus of 2009 to 2012, a lot of state energy offices have looked very carefully at financing. How do we leverage private capital? How do we craft programs? How do we work with partners to reach underserved communities or multifamily buildings or segments of the building sector that might be a little bit difficult to, to, to reach with sort of traditional programs? Um, so I think increased support for state energy program, weatherization are two good examples of things you could do um, that would have um, sort of a, a positive tangential effect on, on financing availability. Mm -hmm. Dr. Motherway. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I think the focus on finance is absolutely correct. And when you look around the world, there are some interesting innovative policies emerging in terms of some countries are now using bulk procurement to drive down the costs of innovative technologies. Some countries are wrapping up the financing with the wider deployment at a community scale. So they're trying to not treat every upgrade as an individual project, which can be more expensive, but maybe get neighborhoods to work together. And as I mentioned earlier, I think public sector leadership is often very strong here because it can be the first mover to show uh, what can be done. When I see finance fail to solve the problem, it's usually when it's, too, it's done in too much isolation and, and assuming that if all that you do is, is make finance available, then, then things will work. But then things like training of the installers, uh, helping people make the right choices, making sure the right technologies uh, are coming onto the market. It needs to be done in that wider sense where finance is an absolutely essential ingredient but won't solve the problem on its own. And that kind of wider capacity building, market development work really is the key to success, I think. That's a good point. That's a good point. You know, I'm, I'm reminded, we, I mentioned earlier, the cold climate housing research center that we have in, in Alaska. It has made just a tremendous, tremendous difference. Um, 
with regards to to building more energy efficient homes in 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 Alaska uh, and and pioneering some technologies that we think are really really cool. Part of the the challenge that they're facing right now as a as a nonprofit is reaching outside audiences, and yet for for the the Arctic um, nations who who deal with cold climate having this level of expertise and knowledge shared with them is is extraordinarily important and so you know when I ask the question about how how what are other countries doing that that we can learn from you know making sure that places like cold climate housing are able to reach that broader audience making sure that that the, the technologies that we uh, can put in place in cold places can be equally applicable in, in hot places as you, as you kind of think about, okay, what's the inverse here? But, but making sure that this, this information is shared. The financing is absolutely key, uh, but as you point out, there are other things. How do, we, how do we make sure that others know about it? How do we make sure that we've got the training? Um, the technology sharing. So this has been, as I anticipated, it would be a, a fascinating discussion. Um, I think we recognize that this is one of those areas that, boy, if, there's, if there was ever any area in the energy space that should be bipartisan, it's like, why wouldn't it be efficiency? In my view, it's probably the most conservative of policies. Don't use something, right? Um, and, and, and so how we, uh, how we build on this um, is so important. And, and again, the opportunity to focus on it not only in our country, um, but, but recognizing that we've got a big earth here that we're all um, paying attention to. And so making sure that everyone is, 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 is learning from this is important. Um, so I appreciate the, the opportunity to, to have this. If there are other bright ideas that any of you have that you would like the committee to, to consider, please, um, please let us know because we, we want to try to do more. I don't like the fact that we're, we're sitting here at number 10 in terms of world leadership when it comes to, to, to efficiency. Um, it, as, as it's been pointed out, it should be the easy things. It should be, we should not see this trend going down for us right now. I want to figure out how we, how we get going back uh, to a, a better place. So we'll work on that with, with your assist. Um, and to my colleagues, know that this will continue to be uh, an important focus for, for me and for us on the committee. So with that, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>